Hello again, and thank you. Um, my name is Lauren Berner. I'm the research manager at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I'm joined today by Joey Kankel, our research associate. I am going to put a link for you all in the chat, and that will also be a link to our slides for today. Um, we're trying something a little bit different, and so these are interactive. You can go back and visit them later. Um, they will update continually with some data as we keep adding. Um, but really just want to make sure that you have that available to you um, as we're going through and also um, afterwards. Um, we're really excited to talk about data and health centers and COVID-19 and what the last two years have looked like. Um, today is intended to be a mix of reflection and looking forward, and we really want to hear from you. This is a Zoom meeting, so you are allowed to unmute yourself at different points throughout um, the conversation today. Um, while folks keep trickling in, uh, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't already. Um, we'll have some points for reflection um, and a couple of different ways to engage in the conversation today. A couple quick housekeeping points. The Council is funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration, and this webinar is funded through the American Rescue Plan, um, but this presentation is not necessarily endorsed by HRSA. If you're unfamiliar with the Council, we're a membership uh, training and advocacy organization. Um, we are focused on supporting those who provide care at the intersection of health and homelessness by building an equitable, high-quality healthcare system. I apologize for my dog in the background. Um, these are our learning objectives for today. Um, we'll have a short evaluation at the end of this session to make sure you feel like we've met these goals and your expectations. If you could just stay on once we're done and answer those questions, that would be great. One of the ways that we are going to engage in the conversation today is to use Mentimeter. We really want this space to allow an opportunity to humanize some of the data that we're showing too. Um, we'll have some breaks with prompts, but we wanted to start um, with a quick way just to get used to Mentimeter. Um, so you can log in either by scanning the QR code with your phone, you can go to menti.com and type in this code, um, or we can uh, include a link in the chat to get directly to this. If you have any issues logging into Mentimeter, you're also more than welcome to continue using the chat feature um, as we go through. To get started, we just want to allow you to um, put a pin where you are located. So when you open up Mentimeter, you'll see this map and you can kind of, if you're on your phone, you can tap it with your finger, you can click it with your mouse, um, and it should populate here um, so we can see where you all are. Just give everyone a minute to get logged in. And Lauren, I am seeing some pop through on my end, so if we end up needing, I can share my screen okay. um, if it's not shown up on yours. Awesome. I'll try to force it to reload. <laughs> there we go. Great. We look like we're hitting a couple different sections of the country, so that's awesome. Um, feel free to keep putting your responses in here. Um, these will remain open um, as we are going through. Before we dig into the data, um, we are going to have some of the prompts. I wanted to share the first one with you. Um, Joey will have this open as we're going through this first section. We're going to be talking about testing um, for COVID. And we just want to allow you the opportunity to reflect on what your experience with COVID-19 testing has been over the last two years. Um, and we'll save some space to respond to this question as we go. But if anything pops up, um, feel free to type that in as you go. Couple of things to get you oriented with the information that we are sharing um, and where it comes from and how it's organized. So over the last two years, the Health Center Program grantees have had the opportunity to report on COVID-19 data, data to HRSA. Initially, this was done weekly. More recently, it's every other week. Um, this data is reported at the health center level. Um, since it's not identifiable, to understand the impact of COVID-19 on people experiencing homelessness who are served at health centers, we broke it down based on health center funding streams or the 330 funding. There are four categories underneath health center funding. 
those are community health centers, healthcare for the homeless, public housing primary care, and migrant health centers. And grantees may have a mixture of those funding sources. And we'll be focusing on healthcare for the homeless funding, or 330H. And we broke that data down into three groups. So as we're moving through the data, that's kind of how it'll be presented to you. The first group is health centers that only have 330H funding. We'll often refer to those as HCH standalones or just standalones. Um, and those serve a majority of people experiencing homelessness. The second group is going to be um, any health center with 330H funding. So that includes the standalones, but also those who have a mixture of other funding sources. Um, and then all health centers, which will be inclusive of HCHs or the, all of the Healthcare for the Homeless programs, as well as any health center that receives 330 funding. We break it out this way, again, because we're unable to determine who is served under which funding stream at a health center. And so especially for HCHs that may fall into that middle category and are a smaller part of a larger community health center, we don't necessarily know how representative the data is of people experiencing homelessness, but that group does make up a large portion of HCHs. So we wanted to kind of include both of those groups here. Um, but when we're thinking about looking at specifically people experiencing homelessness, that's more likely to be representative of that group of only 330H funding. So digging into the data, um, just wanted to start with some praise for health centers. Um, over the last two years, health centers have administered almost 20 million COVID-19 tests. And 5 million of those have been offered by health centers with healthcare for the homeless funding. We've also consistently seen that positivity rates at HCH standalones uh, have been lower than the overall health center population. Um, overall, it's 4.8% compared to 12.66% over the last two years. And that's really a testament to the incredible work that the providers in the HCH community have done and in the health center community more broadly. We saw major pivots to the way that we serve folks, especially those experiencing homelessness, and outreach, education, proactive testing, shelter decompression, isolation and quarantine, all of these things may have prevented many folks from getting COVID-19. Across all health center types, we saw the positivity rates in this most recent quarter. Um, so the first quarter of 2022, um, those are the highest we've seen so far, and that's as we're seeing Omicron spread nationally. We also can see the seasonality of COVID um, with peaks in testing and positivity in late 2020, low points as vaccines rolled out in the second quarter of 2021. We saw health care uh, health centers increase testing and positivity beyond that point into the second half of 2021, but decline this kind of trend declined faster at standalones than it did with those in other funding types. So as noted, up until this first quarter of 2022, HCH standalones really stayed at or below 5% positive per quarter. The larger group of HCHs ranged from 5 to 13% through the end of 2021. And all health centers ranged from 7% to 16%. You may notice that the last quarter here really only shows January and February. We're hoping to get March updated next week. So uh, if you check back on your slide link next week or visit the data dashboard that will be linked later uh, in this presentation, um, you'll be able to see kind of how that looks after we've added March in. Um, but we are seeing that that positivity rate right now is closer to 30% compared to 12%. And the COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted some of the existing health disparities in incidence and severity of infection. We didn't necessarily see the same overall disparities in positivity by race as we saw in the general population, um, but there is a real disparity in testing um, compared to the populations that health centers serve. Specifically at standalones, we saw 19% of those tested over the last two years identified as African American, which is great if you're looking at kind of the overall health center population or the US population, 
but we know that people experiencing homelessness, that number is different. It's 40% of people experiencing homelessness identify as Black or African American. So this kind of breakdown is really showing that we're missing folks in our testing efforts. The overall health center testing percentages do look similar to the populations that are served by health centers. Um, and when we start to look at positivity of those testing positive at standalones, so back over here, um, we see a higher percentage of those who identify as more than one race or did not report their race. So these bottom sections down here compared to the number of folks that were being tested. So the percentages of positives, were, you're more likely to be positive if you were tested in these kind of groups. For HCHs with multiple funding streams um, and overall health centers, about half of those testing positive identified as white. Pause for a moment here just to click through. And again, please feel free to click through your slides on your own as well. Uh, these percentages did shift over time. So we looked at the seasonality of COVID positivity and testing. And you can see the largest shifts in the percentage of unknown race, unknown race and ethnicity, um, as far as testing goes. And then on the positives, you can see kind of some of the seasonal shifts for those who identify as more than one race testing positive. So that's gonna be the purple bar on the positive side here. Now I'm clicking through data pretty quickly, um, but we'll have some time to reflect and, and for Q&A at the end here too. And then across the board, we see that the percentage of those testing positive who identified uh, as Hispanic is greater than the percent of those who were tested. For HCH standalones, 24% of individuals tested identified as Hispanic, um, but 35% of those who tested positive did. Similarly, at all HCHs, 35% tested compared to 47% of those tested positive identified as Hispanic. And for all health centers, 30% tested and 37% of individuals testing positive were Hispanic. And as we saw earlier, this also shifted by quarter. So when we're thinking about the significance of this information, I just wanted to highlight the importance of access to testing and healthcare. Um, as we saw, the population testing doesn't always look like the population served um, or the population of people experiencing homelessness. So it's just kind of highlighting the importance of how we look at our community and how we're building relationships and how we're reaching out to folks. I think it's um, our community does a really great job of building these relationships, but making sure that we're uh, looking at the data and actually reaching the folks that we're trying to reach is so important. So again, we're gonna switch back over to Mentimeter and see um, what your reflections are on testing efforts. This can be related to the data we just saw. It can be kind of your general experience as we pivoted and had to ramp up testing and treatment. Um, it can be positive things that have happened over the last two years, celebrating the work that you've done, um, or it can be some of the challenges that you've experienced. So I just wanna give a moment for you to respond. Um, you see here, we've got one response already. And maybe more coming in, I'll refresh, refresh the page in a moment to you. And if anybody feels more comfortable speaking up, um, more, more than uh, welcome to unmute and kind of share some of your reflections on testing efforts over the last couple of years. Thank you. 
thank you for uh, sharing your reflections and um, kind of how things have slowed down as far as testing goes. Um, we're going to shift now to look over at vaccination efforts by health centers. Um, great news is that health centers have provided at least 9 million first doses of a COVID-19 vaccine to people and fully vaccinated over 8 million individuals and offered 2 million additional doses or booster shots. That's over 21 million doses of vaccine distributed by you and your colleagues. When you're looking at this, I want to make a note that the Johnson & Johnson uh, single dose vaccine is counted as a completed immunization and not in the initiated immunization category. And that's important because when you look here, you can see that there are actually uh, more individuals reported as completed immunization at HCH standalones compared to those who initiated. And that is likely because of the single dose vaccine in our outreach efforts and how we were trying to make sure that we were reaching folks and um, actually being able to follow up and some of the challenges that we were all discussing earlier in the pandemic and thinking about the role that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine played among this population. As you would expect, we saw the majority of these doses uh, offered between April and June 2021 across the board. This peak is pretty substantial um, and a sharp decline in the second half of that year. We did see a bump of vaccine initiation around the same time we started offering boosters. So this is noticeable on each slide, but particularly noticeable um, for all health centers. Uh, more folks were starting the vaccine series around the same time folks were um, receiving their third or second shot, depending on um, what they received initially. And when we break this down by race, um, looking at this slide, you can see that 30% of those who initiated vaccination at an HGH standalone identified as Asian. A few slides ago, uh, this chart looked a little bit different as far as who accessed testing. Um, we see the percentage of those who identify as African American accounted for about 5% of folks initiating vaccination. Um, that was compared to 20, almost 20% 20 of those who sought testing at an HCH standalone, so the same clinics. Um, and this 5% is about half of what the percentage breakdown looked like for folks who received vaccination at all HCHs and all health centers. So it's really important as we're thinking about how we are distributing vaccines about kind of what our outreach and education and really our relationship building looks like with our communities. Um, the council did a series a few months ago on trustworthiness of providers. And I think just kind of referencing back to some of that, thinking about how we are working to build trust with our communities and really demonstrating trustworthiness in our community can make sure that some of these numbers look a little bit more like the population that we're serving, um, both through our testing efforts and also um, through our primary care. And you can also see, um, similarly to our testing efforts, uh, demographics shifted by quarter. Um, interesting is you can see that the number of, or the percentage of unreported was much higher in the latter half of 2021. We don't know if this is a disclosure um, concern where folks aren't reporting or if we were as a system a little bit um, overwhelmed and not necessarily reporting this as consistently, um, especially as we started to see some of the Omicron wave towards the end of this time frame. And when we look at a breakdown of those who initiated vaccination by ethnicity, we saw that about 23% at standalones identified as Hispanic. That is compared to about 35% of those at um, all HCHs and health, all health centers. Um, this was pretty consistent when we look at who initiated and who completed and is fully vaccinated. So that's a good thing. And again, you can look at this data by quarter. 
Um, we do see that there is a shift. Um, there's a larger percentage of individuals identifying as Hispanic who um, initiated and completed vaccination in July through September of 2021, as well as another increase in the first quarter of 2022. I wanted to just kind of quickly highlight the data that we have on boosters or additional doses by race and ethnicity. Um, these breakdowns look pretty similar to the ones we saw in the last few slides. Um, very similar percentages of folks uh, coming back for that additional dose when we break it down. I won't spend too much time here, um, but as boosters were only available starting in September, um, as you're looking at this, um, just a quick note that some of this might be a little bit skewed by the fact that there's only one month in this first tab and then uh, three months or two months in this last tab. So these aren't necessarily evenly divided at this point, um, but helpful to kind of see some of those shifts. We're going to come back over to our friend Mentimeter and think about um, what our vaccination efforts have looked like. Um, so I see here that there's some additional response about frustrations from patients and test times. Definitely, <laughs> I remember myself waiting in a two hour line for a COVID test uh, before seeing family. Um, and I know that that can be frustrating for folks, especially um, who may have a long day ahead of them trying to access different resources in their community. Um, so I'd love just reflections on kind of what this shift looked like as we started focusing on vaccination. And I wonder too, Lauren, something that stuck out to me of what you were discussing about the trend with the Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine. I'm, I'm curious if, if anyone um, in the chat or by unmuting would be interested in, in chatting about how the trajectory of the different types of vaccines um, have looked for you. Um, if, you've if you've relied, especially more recently on, on the two shot series, as opposed to earlier in the vaccine days. Of last summer. That's a great question, Joey. Seeing a few things coming through in the chat. Um, it looks like one person's not seeing the option to answer this on Menti yet. Um, Katie uh, said that she heard amazing stories about how health centers were able to provide vaccine events in shelters and in campus. I found that uh, every way possible to make sure uh, people experiencing homelessness or vaccinated if they wanted to be. Yes, um, this is something that uh, we have heard a lot about as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Katie. Um, and then another response that um, they were frustrated that community health centers were not part of the initial plan for distribution of vaccines. Um, and I think that's a, an important point about how uh, well it community health centers are positioned to really reach out to the community and make sure that we are reaching folks who may not have access to other resources and um, how community health centers are really good at re responding and identifying 
social determinants of health like transportation um, that may have been a major barrier for folks accessing some of these services or um, I know that early on a lot of the appointments had to be made in a specific way um, and thinking about folks who may not have been able to access um, the internet at a specific time before slots filled up or something like that so um, that is such an important point and reflection on this time. And it looks like we have two responses that have come through on Menti, so I think refreshing might bring those up. Excellent. Um, need more interpreters for vaccine events? Yes, definitely. Um, difficult to determine the vaccination rate among people experiencing homelessness. Thought the one shot J&J &J would be good for seasonal migrant farm workers, but many didn't want that vaccine for religious reasons. So they stopped offering that particular vaccine due to lack of interest. I think that's a great example of kind of responding to the needs and interest of the community. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there was a question in the chat about data on vaccination among migrant and seasonal farm workers. We are working on getting that um, pulled together. We have a little bit um, going back to of September of this year. Um, it is not currently on our dashboard, but we are planning to add it soon. Um, so we can be sure to um, get that to you. Um, and you are always welcome to reach out to us um, if you are interested. Thank you all for your reflections here. Um, please feel free to keep commenting in the chat as we keep going. Um, wanted to switch briefly to a conversation on a health center capacity. Um, some of these data points are no longer being collected, um, but we thought it was important, especially looking at kind of that first year of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and thinking about how our health centers had to respond while also facing capacity challenges. So looking at um, staff positivity, we see that this October through December of 2020 and even into March, uh, January through March of 2021, um, we had a pretty sizable number of providers uh, who were testing positive at clinics. And if you recall from some of our earlier slides or personal experience, um, this was also a time where we were having large uh, spikes in positivity nationally, as well as folks accessing testing. And so not only were more of our folks um, contracting COVID-19 or exposed to COVID-19, but we also had our own staff and our colleagues and possibly friends who were experiencing this while also trying to cover um, our staffing and making sure that we had enough folks available to provide care. Um, so that's a, a pretty significant challenge that a lot of uh, our health centers faced and may continue to face um, right now. So just wanted to kind of highlight what this really looked like, um, because I know that we've heard this from folks, but um, just wanted to show that this was something that was happening nationally as well. We also saw early on a lot of um, clinics had to close specific sites. So health centers may have multiple sites. It doesn't necessarily mean that an entire health center closed, but we saw a pretty sizable number of health center sites close over time. Um, and you can see kind of how this has trickled down. We have more sites open now than we did at the peak of the pandemic or the early on in the pandemic here. Um, but we also know that any site closure is a limit to access and uh, an additional barrier to um, providing services to folks. So wanted to just kind of highlight that while things are improving, there's we're still not quite back to where we were at the beginning. We also um, wanted to just highlight that while a lot of sites were closed, we did have a pretty significant uptick in the percentage of sites 
uh, percentage of visits that were conducted via telehealth. So in that first quarter, when we had a lot of sites closed, about 50%, 45 to 50% of visits were held via telehealth, which is a great way to pivot. And I know that this is something that a lot of folks were trying to ramp up and maybe had been in talks about, but now immediately had to shift their model of care. And um, as things have opened back up, that percentage has gone down, but we're still at about 20% of our visits are being conducted via telehealth. So we're gonna go back to Mentimeter. Um, and again, continue to type into the chat if that is more convenient for you. Um, but really wanted to think about kind of how has COVID-19 impacted your day-to-day -day operation? Um, we're about two years in at this point and know that while things have shifted back and forth, there are things that have happened in the day-to-day -day practice of your um, health center. And we would love just for you to reflect on kind of what things have stuck around, how things have shifted over time. Joey, if you could just let me know when, when we're getting some things in. And Joey put a good question in the chat about has telehealth remained an important piece of your service delivery? Vaccination and prevention in primary care uh, is primary in our service delivery system. Yes, um, PBE is here to stay. Yes, definitely kind of ramping up some of the masking efforts in clinics and things like that. The other piece of health center capacity that I just wanted to highlight here was um, thinking about our test turnaround times. Um, so in a time where we didn't all have access to rapid tests, what did this look like? Um, well, in the first year, so April 2020 through March 2021, most often the test turnaround time was about two to three days. Um, we saw kind of a longer amount of time, more folks kind of reporting uh, more than five days um, in that July through September 2020 timeframe as we were trying to make sure that our labs could ramp up and get connected, um, making sure that we could get things back to people in time. Um, so really kind of thinking about what that looked like and then um, how it kind of started to taper off um, later in 20, uh, into 2021, um, where we started to see some of those shorter times coming around. And then in uh, April 2021 through February 2022, excuse me, um, we really started to see more of the rapid tests coming around. So a much higher uh, kind of proportion of tests that were on average being returned in an hour or in a day. Um, very few health centers were reporting that their average um, turnaround time was more than a day, which is a pretty significant change when you compare it to where we were a year prior. Um, and that makes such a difference in our contact tracing efforts, um, identifying 
who may have been exposed to COVID and how we're able to respond, thinking about um, the impact of limited resources and isolation and quarantine with limited resources um, and how we're able to uh, provide that for folks. Um, and if we have limited resources and it's taking three days to get a result back, how do we kind of navigate those uh, in between times? Um, so re really thinking about how we're in a place now where we are much better able to manage spread as far as being able to identify it early. Um, I'm seeing some really great thoughts in the chat. Um, and we would just love to hear more about kind of how test turnaround time has impacted your ability to provide care and also just how um, care has shifted at your health center. Um, seeing more thoughts in the chat about kind of the challenges of keeping up with regulations and supports, needing to notify patients if certain services are attached to COVID care, covered or not. Um, seeing that telehealth is vital, not only because of COVID, but also um, difficulties with travel. Um, for community health workers, losing the in-person aspect was challenging, especially for maintaining relationships. Um, even when services are open, the rate of return is slower than anticipated. Telehealth large portion of patient contact. Interesting, Danica, the um, kind of little change in mask wearing, but kind of less thought towards um, whether or not someone would catch the virus as people started to get vaccinated. Um, and that folks weren't getting tested unless they were seriously sick, but would come to work with a cold. Um, most people were getting vaccinated. That's great. And we have one from Menti that looks like um, someone heard a lot about the lack of availability of rapid tests, which is a huge barrier. Um, and that at times surveillance testing in shelters wasn't possible because of the lack of testing. Yes, that's great. Thank you all so much for, for sharing. I think it's so important to add in some of this context about kind of what the numbers actually mean um, and how does that play out in your day-to-day -day work. So I really appreciate you all um, sharing here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Joey. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit um, to talk about vaccination data that we have specifically for uh, special populations. Um, so this is data set is a little bit different from um, what we just what Lauren was going over, because it's really about a subset of health centers that received vaccines through um, the HRSA and CDC funded health center COVID-19 vaccine program. Um, so the data that you're seeing here are really uh, vaccines that were uh, distributed to hard to reach and disproportionately affected populations. Um, so currently on the slide is really specific to folks experiencing homelessness um, and who access vaccines through the program. Um, and again, as Lauren mentioned before, this data goes back um, to September of 2021, and we're still receiving this data, but it's most um, up to date um, as of February 2022. So in the first tab of the cumulative data for different health center categories that we have focused on um, so far, um, it really shows that across all health center types on here that just as many People experiencing homelessness completed their vaccination series than initiative or than initiated rather, and even more in some cases. Um, so this really reflects what Lauren was mentioning earlier about um, the promotion of the one shot Johnson and Johnson vaccine spe specifically for healthcare for the homeless type settings uh, for logistical reasons. Um, but then as you explore the quarterly trends, so from September and into quarter four of last year. Um, 
it's a little bit hard to make judgments because we only have the one month of quarter three in 2021, but we do see an incline in series initiation and completion across all health center types. Um, with the majority of all vaccinations in the of the data that we have so far, all of the vaccinations, the majority of those occurring in October to December of 2021. And the steepest incline really being seen in vaccine boosters. Um, so moving forward into the data that we have from 2022, um, we're still waiting on the last month of the first quarter, which is March, but we do see and we expect this data to really hit below um, the points that we saw in 2021 of quarter four with all of the categories of initiating, completing, and the additional dose uh, falling significantly during these first three months of 2022. Um, so before sort of hearing your reflections on this particular vaccination data, we'd like to again sort of just take a moment and use this data to uh, celebrate the remarkable resource that health centers are for um, folks experiencing homelessness and, and other uh, marginalized communities. It's just really amazing to look at the sheer numbers of, of vaccines that were distributed at, um, at y'all's workplaces and, and really this data reveals that the expertise and the strategies utilized by especially healthcare for the homeless programs in particular are really effective at, at reaching the folks that you're, you're trying to, to reach. Um, so we wanted to, and I'll go back to Menti. I didn't give you all an opportunity to reflect until now, but um, if you have any thoughts on the specific strategies that you all have found to be successful in terms of providing vaccines, whether it is through this program or whether it, um, more generally, um, but to really reflect on your outreach to people experiencing homelessness um, related to vaccine efforts. We have one come through that says slow and steady. It often takes multiple visits before someone is willing to get vaccinated. In, in a couple of slides, we'll have um, a very brief mention of uh, specific interventions like vaccine education or vaccine ambassador programs. Um, so curious if anyone on the call today has experience with that type of intervention, um, we'd love to hear from you. And someone just now in Menti said vaccine ambassadors, those with lived, ex lived experience have been a great bridge. And one more, addressing concerns around side effects helped people get uh, to a yes from hesitant. Great feedback. Yeah, and Elena mentioned in the chat that that was her comment about vaccine ambassadors. If, if you'd like to unmute Elena and reflect a little bit on vaccine ambassador programs, that'd be great. Hi, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, just to share a little bit. So the council, so I'm um, director of implementation research here at the council I'm staff here. And we initiated a vaccine ambassador program where we awarded about 15 organizations, health centers, that um, we're gonna utilize vaccine ambassadors, specifically community health workers that have lived experience to do outreach at, um, at encampments um, for individuals specifically experiencing homelessness, as well as those who are actively using drugs, as well as um, those persons who engage in sex work. So um, it's been really great, the partnerships that I think we were seeing between health centers and some harm reduction um, agencies um, partner. We're also seeing health centers partnering with um, fire stations as well to um, reach out to different populations. So there's a good mix of um, different ways people are partnering, but the community health workers specifically have been um, extremely helpful in encampments and just kind of meeting individuals where they are. So they're the first person that someone encounters and not necessarily a health staff member, but they do have the um, health nurse or whoever 
nearby so that they can give the vaccination um, on site if needed so that they don't have to necessarily transport or move to a different um, health center. But it's been great. We're meeting our targets. People are getting vaccinated. Um, the complete series. We don't have booster data, but it's just been really um, successful. So, um, and it, in addition to just increasing vaccinations, it's showing the value of um, community health workers and just the return on investment of that workforce. So, happy to chat more. Amazing. Okay, ask questions. Thanks, Elena. Yeah, I'm sure Elena would be happy to hear from you if you have any questions or, or thoughts on the Vaccine Investor Program. Um, we got one more before we move forward. Uh, somebody mentioned using motivational interviewing and meeting people where they are as a, a great uh, technique and approach to uh, the vaccine conversation. Thank you all so much for your participation in that um, section. We have about 15 minutes left. So as we um, move toward the, the latter parts of our conversation today, we wanted to shift away from this kind of retrospective approach that we've taken so far. You know, we've been reflecting on the data from the two years since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, and we wanted to really transition into thinking about the present and future tenses of COVID-19 um, by really considering these leading uh, data questions. So first, what are the current priorities around COVID-19 and, and COVID-19 data efforts? Um, what are the emerging issues that we're seeing right now and how can they be supported by improving our data efforts and then really thinking more towards the future about what should we be talking about or what data are we missing what data would we like to have to really support our our planning and efforts moving forward and then finally um, a good thought that we would love to hear from you all is like what would we like to know a year from now so what types of data can we work toward achieving and gathering so that we can better understand our field and, and reflect a year from now. So before, I guess we can move to the next slide, Lauren. And um, we really wanted to mention briefly um, an approach that we took to really uh, center ourselves in the present moment is to look at our data dashboards. So Lauren mentioned all of the data that we've been going over today is, is housed on the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council um, COVID-19 dashboard. And so we're able to look at analytic data from this dashboard to see which sections people are most interested in and um, really engaging with, um, clicking on, spending time looking at. So we really find this data useful to really guide our conversations and what is most important. Um, so first, uh, comparative testing data or positivity by health center type. Um, folks are really still engaging with this section of our dashboard are really still interested in um, positivity, um, where and when the hotspots are really occurring. And then the next two vaccine series initiation by race and ethnicity and virus detection by race and ethnicity is really centering the health equity piece. So people are really interested in, in still um, needing to have this conversation around equity in terms of um, COVID-19 response and COVID-19 uh, testing and positivity. And then finally, um, to kind of, uh, you know, based off of what we just mentioned with the COVID-19 vaccine program, um, the section of the dashboard looking at vaccines distributed through that vaccine program has caught a lot of uh, folks' attention as well. So going on to the next slide, um, really looking forward, um, and a lot of this coming from that data we just showed you of in terms of what people are really engaging with and also what we're hearing from the field, um, is that really equity has, is, and will continue to be a necessary focus in our data efforts. Uh, we're still learning a lot from the data of the past two years in terms of how the pandemic has um, impacted poor and low income communities across the US. Um, and in fact, so just this week, um, some of you on the call might be aware, but a new report from the Poor People's Campaign, um, I believe is on Monday, was published with which, among some other outcomes, really showed that the most devastating and disproportionate outcomes of the pandemic were connected to the lived experience of poverty. Um, and importantly, the authors noted that while virus, while the virus did not discriminate between rich and poor, society and the government's response 
to the pandemic did discriminate between rich and poor. Um, so as we still process the toll of the winter's Omicron surge, we're really reminded that um, despite the ease of COVID restrictions and the decline of funding that we're expecting for COVID-19 programs, um, now is not the time to let down our guard, especially in terms of health equity and in tracking this type of, of information. So data has um, and will continue to be critical for our evaluation of every stage of the pandemic response and the focal areas um, that we really anticipate and, and would love to hear reflections on are um, first, who has access to testing in health centers, including rapid tests, PCR tests. We heard from, from somebody on the call that um, rapid tests were really difficult to, to gather. And so um, this type of information is really useful for our planning. Um, and then booster shots. We heard just last week that the newest round of vaccine boosters has been approved, which is just a reminder that boosters will continue to be a central tool in our uh, prevention for, for all communities in the US um, and in the world. But uh, the infrastructure to track uh, who is accessing these booster shots in particular will be really helpful in our, our planning as we look into the next year. And then finally, uh, we wanted to mention who is accessing COVID-19 related therapies. Um, the connection between a positive test and uh, COVID-19 therapies is really still a growing area that we expect to learn more about this year. Um, an example, just last month, the Biden-Harris administration introduced a, a test to treat initiative, uh, which will have um, links available for all of you interested in learning more about that. But the test to treat initiatives are really a model for linking folks who are testing positive for COVID um, and quickly linking them with antiviral um, medication. Um, so as these types of approaches come up, we want to make sure that folks experiencing homelessness have adequate access to this type of treatment. Um, and so this is important to emphasize through data. Um, so the next slide will be specific to vaccines. Um, so data will continue to play a significant role in our understanding of how COVID vaccines are deployed to underserved populations um, at different levels of national, regional, and, um, and, and really local contexts. But again, um, we can really expect the landscape of vaccines to shift a lot this year with the decline in COVID-19 funding um, that we're expecting to come soon. So a few minutes ago, we shared data on the number of consumers served through the COVID-19 vaccine program, which again is, is projected to result in a decline for the final quarter uh, or from the final quarter of 2021 into the beginning of this year. Um, but it's important to gather data and information about how those that have not been vaccinated so far, um, um, their reasons for um, remaining hesitant or their reasons for not accessing that vaccine yet. Um, we heard a little bit about the vaccine ambassador programs from Elena, but um, evaluating the efficacy of other types of vaccine approaches are, is really important. Um, educating the community about vaccines, um, as well as, as doing outreach, um, street outreach with vaccines. We'd love to have more information about the efficacy of these types of approaches. Um, and then another final really important component of vaccines in 2022 is the general decreasing uh, trend of uh, demand for vaccines, which is really due to a lot of factors, but is expected to continue decreasing, especially again in the wake of the lack of COVID-19 spending. Um, so this decrease in demand is really unfortunately expected to really impact, uh, disproportionately impact on house populations and other marginalized groups. So it's important again to maintain the infrastructure and also the will to collect and analyze and share this type of data around vaccine availability and vaccine connections that will really be so important in this in the next phases of the pandemic. Um, so I think we can skip the next slide, Lauren. Um, and really, as we enter into our last five minutes, um, we wanted to make sure to, to have a moment to really reflect on the importance of, yes, qual uh, quantitative data that we have gone over so far and spent a lot of time talking about um, in 
our conversation so far, but also really mentioned the importance of qualitative data and storytelling um, and really learning from consumers on a local level. Um, we really just like we as far as storytelling and, and the type of of um, planning and things that we can really glean from quantitative data, we need to make sure that we are um, supporting that with storytelling of impacts of the pandemic on a local and individual level. Um, we're hearing a lot from people in terms of the long term mental health impacts of the pandemic in terms of how the pandemic has led to a lack of resources. Um, but asking consumers actually how they have been impacted by the pandemic is such an important piece of this conversation to make sure that we're really having a holistic approach to um, to understanding the pandemic. So we have a few minutes left, but I think there is a moment to reflect on this piece, um, which the leading question here is, what are the emerging issues that can be supported through data? We'd love to hear if any of this reflect or any of this resonated with you, or if you have any thoughts on where we really should be focusing our energy in terms of data. Also, feel free to type any questions you have in the chat so we can try to get to those um, before the end of the day as well. Any final thoughts before we close out our session today? This is your opportunity. As we are winding down on time, please feel free to keep um, responding in Mentimeter or in the chat. Um, but we would love if you could also just take a moment to um, let us know how we did. There'll be a survey that pops up when we close out. Um, and we'd really appreciate you just taking a moment to let us know. Um, we also have a link to some of the resources we mentioned here. Um, and uh, we've got all of these little icons here are clickable, so you can go directly to the data dashboard, um, more information on the Health Center vaccine program, the Poor People's Pandemic Report, test treat, um, and then Joey and I have our contact information here. Um, there are a few other thoughts in the chat around um, enhancing data collection on um, farm workers, um, data by language. I think that is definitely um, important when we're thinking about equity, um, as well as using the COVID response experience um, to advocate for uh, community health center engagement from the beginning of emerging, issue, emerging issues. That is also great, making sure that we're centering the expertise of our community and our providers um, in this work. Thank you for that. Um, if you are available in a month, we would love to see you at our national conference in Seattle. You can find more information on our website. Um, we will be in person for the first time in two years um, and would love to, to have the opportunity to connect with you there. Um, and if you are interested in more information on the council, you can follow us on social media or check out our website. We are newly on uh, Instagram and TikTok. So, um, Perhaps there will be some fun uh, viral information on there for you all to take a look at. Um, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate you taking an hour of your day to spend with us talking about data and really look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks for all the work that you're doing.